Thank you. Uh, so first let me thank uh, Yonu Tremi and uh, all the Bekasim uh, team for their kind invitation. And uh, let me also mention that the, the, the result that I will present is a joint work with Bob Gerard, who will arrive uh, tomorrow, and who is from the University of Toronto. And this is the result because we are interested, so we are mathematicians, and we are interested in uh, justifying or giving a mathematical proofs in certain asymptotic regimes of uh, phenomenon that are observed, and uh, some of them are known uh, for a very long time, you will see, uh, 200 years. Uh, in fluid mechanics. Um, so they will be in the regime where the analogy between uh, uh, real fluids and quantum fluids is flagrant, but the results so far are available only for uh, quantum fluids, say for the gross pitayevsky uh, model. And I will try to explain why and what are the, the difficulties which one would have to face to tackle the, the classical fluid uh, case. So as my title says, this is about uh, <coughs> leapfrogging. So no, the title didn't say that. So this is leapfrogging for vortex rings. And uh, so I just started by a, a movie which I like on leapfrogging, because also there are some uh, aspects that are important and that can be seen on that. So this is, this is from a, uh, this is a, 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 um, a video that is accompanying a paper in Nature in 2013. It is in water, um, and it is a, a vortex range, which you know well. But uh, uh, I think it is important to, uh, to highlight this very thin core which you see here, because when you just see particle in motion, it's difficult to make the threshold between what is just the uh, what is part of the of the fluid velocity but where there is no vorticity just there is just circulation and what is the part of the fluid where vorticity is and this is something which you cannot see just by looking at the velocity fields unless you are able to compute the vorticity in a differential way and and I like this movie because it tends to even though it is not a proof at all but it tends to show that there, there is this region where you see the particles, and probably there are no vorticity here, and maybe the vorticity is just here along the, this thin core. And, and this is pretty much a situation which we will study, where the, the length scale at which the vorticity comes into play is much smaller than the length scale of the, of the global flow. Okay, so this is one thing. So this is just one vortex ring, and, uh, oops. Yes, and uh, so the existence of vortex rings or the, uh, was already more than uh, observed. It was, uh, some people would say, justified by Helmholtz, even though he didn't give a proof, but he did a lot of computations. So this uh, is paper in 1858 in Journal de Crel, where he studied mathematically the Euler equation for three-dimensional fluids with a point of view on the vorticity. And uh, he says that uh, a vortex rings would uh, uh, travel with a constant speed, a big, I don't remember his exact word, this is the, the translation by Tate a few years later because the original paper was in German, but uh, constant and very great velocity, but he actually computes it. He shows that it is proportional to the logarithm of the, uh, of the width of the vortex core. Uh, is not able to prove that such uh, an object, a mathematical object, is stable in the sense that it cannot prove that if the initial data of the three-dimensional Euler equation is something very close to a vortex ring, then at later time it is close to a vortex ring at a fixed distance, eh, corresponding to the, to the travel distance of the vortex rings. But nevertheless, it is, and it is actually the, one of the very first time in mathematics where conservation where, where conservation of some quantities are known, are, are used to get some information on the solution. And there he uses what he called the con conservation of vis visa, vice visa in this, in this case, so energy, to prove that if the solution still looks like a vortex ring, then its position is precisely where the theory predicts it to be. Okay? So he cannot prove that a vortex ring is something stable 
that if you start at time zero here, it will be a vortex rings at time zero there, at time one there. But he proved that if you start with the vortex rings at time zero here, if at time one it is a vortex ring, then it is there and not here or there. So this was in the first, uh, first half of his paper. And in the second half, he studied the situation where you don't no longer have just one vortex rings, but two or more of them, and their interaction. And here, it, there are much less computation with respect to the first part. But still, he draws some conclusion. And that, was, that one was really mysterious to me in the sense that there is no computation at all in the paper <laughs> that would lead to that, but he probably did it. And, and he says the following. So now you consider you take two vortex rings that will both travel in the same in the same direction, and uh, and they they share the same uh, axis of uh, symmetry. Then they, there will be an attraction between them. So any all, uh, any of them has, has its own speed of travel of uh, travel, which corresponds to uh, to its uh, to its shape to its radius. But then they will interact, and uh, the one who is behind is going to be attracted by the uh, by the first one, and, and uh, vice versa. And they will penetrate in each other, and then play this leapfrogging motion, which gave the the, the name to the, in particular, to the title uh, of this talk. So uh, maybe the easiest way to uh, observe what it is is to make a reference to this very beautiful experiment by Lim in Singapore, uh, which dates back, I think, already 20, almost 20 years ago, and uh, which I can show you. So this is a, a transversal cut of, uh, this is also real fluid, this is water with uh, ink to, to to uh, isolate uh, some fluid particles. So as, uh, no, not fluid particles, but as a, as a scalar, as a passive scalar. And uh, how do I launch it? So you can see it's fast. It's fast because it's probably also uh, uh, much more unstable than, uh, or, or less stable than a single vortex rings. But at least you can see one cycle of the two vortex rings going uh, around each other. Uh, and this is done with a presumably uh, uh, very precise and uh, costly apparatus. And, but I've asked some, uh, there are some students in Grandes Ecoles in France who have to do, uh, it's called TIPE, and they, they went to me and asked me for an exercise to do, and I proposed them to try to rebuild this. And uh, they actually managed to do, uh, they, they don't do a full leapfrogging, but uh, with very cheap apparatus. They have devised also, you see, so yeah. almost a leapfrogging. This was half. I, I, I'm not sure that it ends up the, the loop. The, the one is passing inside the other ones. Uh, OK, so, so this is just to exemplify what I call leapfrogging. And uh, OK, and we will be interested in proving that in some regime, a mathematical equation behaves like that, in the sense that there is a solution and we can compare the difference between the true solution and what we believe to be this, uh, this uh, leapfrogging motion. So before that, I would like to convince you that first there is a hope that this kind of motion, we have heard about turbulence in the previous talk, that this kind of motion is very far from uh, turbulence and it's actually a very, uh, very stable motion, at least for one uh, vortex ring. Uh, well, you, you, if you are a smoker, maybe you have observed that in, uh, in nature. Uh, but let me quote here, so this is also excerpted from a paper uh, by uh, Kelvin uh, about the same time as Helmholtz, maybe uh, 20 years after. And uh, also I've seen that there are some proposition of uh, open source library for gross pitevsky equation among the tools. So this can be understood as uh, Kelvin's uh, open source uh, cardboard plus plus uh, uh, library for solving the 3D Euler equation. It just, he, 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 so he read the paper by Helmholtz. He was actually very much influenced by, uh, by that paper. And, they, and he devised uh, an apparatus just uh, taking a cardboard box. He explained how to, to take a hole, which is, uh, I think, half the size of the box in this case. And, uh, and, uh, and you need a way somehow to, to make an initial impulse. And that was done by Kelvin with, uh, with some Indian rubber, if I remember well. And I tried to rebuild it myself, but I, I replaced the rubber, which I didn't have, by just uh, smashing the box with my 
two hands and what I would like you to pay attention to is the fact that the kind of stability that we see, it seems that the vortex ring is, is really traveling without any change of shape and it's also traveling on a long distance with respect to, if you think in terms of uh, of turbulence, this is uh, this this is a 10 meter distance. Afterwards, you don't see it anymore, but you, you can make it travel even even to longer distance if you put your uh, I don't know your uh, your daughter or whatever a bit further. You will still still see the effect of the vortex ring uh, in the air in the hair, for example. Okay, so this seems to be a, a good news from a mathematical point of view, at least for uh, one vortex. So now I will switch to uh, mathematical equations and I will try to, in the rest of the talk, to make the connection and to give some, uh, some precise statements. So this would be for the uh, classical fluids. So I recall just there the, the Euler equation for three-dimensional fluids and I will pay a bit of time to make the parallel with the Gross-Pitaevsky equation, which I write after. So here, the, the important uh, variable is the velocity field V, which is the, field, the, the velocity of the air. The, the pressure can be, uh, can be uh, eliminated by going into the vorticity formulation. So this was the main goal of, the, of Helmholtz's paper, to, to write the equation just in terms of this little omega here. And the important thing for the Euler equation is that uh, so now you get an equation both for the velocity and the vorticity, but the velocity is not, a, is not a new variable. It can be recovered completely from the vorticity through the Biot-Savar law. And this is something uh, which will not be the case for the, uh, for the Gross-Pitaevsky equation. I, 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 sorry, I wasn't there this morning, but I have heard in the first talk of this afternoon that this question was tackled this morning. And uh, so this is the uh, Gross-Pitaevsky equation. Uh, for me, uh, there are much less uh, constants than in physicists' talk, but for, for me, everything hands back to this uh, epsilon uh, parameter here, which has the length, which has the, the dimension of a length in the e equation written in this way. And the parallel with the uh, Euler equation is through the, this little j here and the capital J here. So maybe I could put that on the blackboard. So for Euler, we had V, and for Gross, so, so this is uh, at, uh, at fixed time and, and, uh, and time and space, this is in, in R3, and for Gross-Pitaevsky, we just have a U, which is in the complex, <coughs> but I will, uh, to V will be associated what I call little j of U, which is EU grad U. This is uh, this is a scalar product in in the via, in the in the image. So in C, so may maybe the easiest way to understand that is to say that if u is a rho exponential i phi, I'm sorry, mathematicians like to call the modulus of complex number as rho is not square root of rho. Then j of u is is rho square, the gradient of the phase. So this will be uh, u if if. The speed is something very natural for a fluid. The speed for a superfluid, you, you should think of it uh, this way if you don't know already, which probably many of you know. And therefore, the vorticity, uh, here was, you had uh, uh, omega, which was the curve of V. Uh, if we follow this, we would have that what corresponds to the vorticity is the curl of this little j. And this is a Jacobian factor, uh, up to a factor two. This is the Jacobian of, of U, so the, the, the Jacobian determinant, uh, which is that in, which in, in that case is a two form because these are fields in R3 uh, of U, which is valued in C. So if you don't want to look too much into the details to the object, just keep in mind that this capital J of U corresponds to the vorticity omega for real fluids, and this little j corresponds to the to the velocity uh, little v. And here I, I, I just uh, uh, wrote what I said before, the fact that in, in contrast with the Euler equation for the Gross-Pitaevsky equation, if you know uh, capital J of U, so if you know the vorticity, you cannot recover the velocity. There are, there are additional degrees of freedom that are hidden in the, in the phase and which correspond to the, uh, to the compressibility part of the, uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And in particular, you see uh, in this expression, 
in this expression, if you take something that, that is a pure phase, so if the modulus is constant equal to one, then the curl of a gradient is always zero. Okay, so uh, fields that are purely fa pure phase have no curl, so have no vorticity, yet they have a velocity. So that's the, 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 these are the additional degrees of freedom of the gross pitevsky equation with respect to the, uh, to the uh, Euler equation. The analogy in terms of uh, evolu equation as an evolution, not just this was formal, but now one justification or hope for justification of this correspondence w could, uh, can be seen in the following uh, weak form of the equation. So I just look at, uh, now I, I assume I have a solution. I take a solution of the gross pitevsky equation with an initial data and I will compute the time derivative of some averages of the vorticity against a test function phi. So phi is an, an arbitrary uh, vector field. Okay, and I look at the time derivative of this quantity when you solve the gross pitevsky equation. You compute and it gives you a, a forcing term which has this expression. So it, it is, uh, you see, it is quadratic in U and it involves the first derivative of u and higher derivatives of the, of the test field. Okay. We will not enter into the details on the significations of, of this term, but just make the, the exercise. If you do the exact same uh, computation for the Euler equation, so now here you have the vorticity vector field against a, a, a test vector field phi, you recover the same formula, just that here, on the right hand side, it applies to gradient u, and gradient u is not what is corresponding to here. Here it acts on v, okay, and here it acts on gradient u. But recall that v is not something which is corresponding to gradient u, but only to j, little j of u here. Okay? So th that's one of the differences. Uh, between the two, and in the asymptotic regime, which we will look at, somehow uh, one of the mathematical difficulties is to prove that uh, most of the terms involved in this forcing terms would be the same if one would replace this gradient u by little j of u. And, and this is uh, the, where the mathematical difficulties are. But other than that, the, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the equivalent seem qu seems quite clear in these two uh, weak formulations of the equation. And, uh, and I just requoted here that uh, for the gross pitevsky equation, you need an additional, this is not, this does not describe fully the equation. It is just a consequence of the equation and you, you don't recover every information on you with this equation by making, uh, varying the test function phi. You need also some information to recover the non-compressible part. And this is the, uh, the, the continuity equation, which is written here. And from which you can see, I, I wrote here this epsilon one over epsilon on purpose, which means that, um, so this quantity dt of this, uh, this is part of the energy, okay? The L2 norm of this is in the energy, in the gross pitevsky energy. So in particular, so it is finite uh, when average in, in time. And so this equation tells you that the divergence of, uh, here I wrote it in, uh, already in uh, axisymmetric uh, variable, sorry, that the divergence of little j is epsilon averaged in time. So it asymptotically will be uh, zero. In the, in the limit, epsilon tends to zero, which will be our, our framework. Okay, so uh, before trying to, to uh, understand mathematically the interaction between uh, vortex strings, one should first uh, deal with their just existence, and in that case, it is a, a relatively simple, uh, yet it has taken some time uh, to mathematicians to, uh, to <coughs> prove, to establish their existence on say, sound mathematical grounds. For, for, and, and there is also an interesting di difference between the two. For the, uh, for the Euler equation, you maximize the, uh, the kinetic energy. So here I just rewrote the kinetic energy in terms of the vorticity, but this is nothing else than the, than the 2D, uh, the U squared, uh, the uh, V squared with my notation. So the, the, <coughs> the kinetic energy and the constraint is that the momentum is fixed. 
uh, say one component of the momentum. So I, 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 since I'm studying vortex rings sharing the same axis of rotation, in all the talks I work in uh, cylindrically symmetric coordinates, okay, with z being my axis of, uh, of symmetry. So I look at the component of the, of the momentum, of the fluid momentum in the z direction, I fixed it to a constant, and this is still not enough for Euler. You know, there are so many degrees of freedom in Euler uh, that uh, you cannot do that. There is no quantization in particular. And so one way to do this is to ask that the vorticity, this is also a fact of the Euler equation. In 2D, the vorticity is transported by the flow. In 3D, this is no longer true. You know that there is those uh, uh, stretching effects and so on. But in axisymmetric coordinates, uh, it is almost true that it is transported by the flow. It is omega over r, which is uh, transported by the flow. And so you fix an initial measure of vorticity, and you just you just work in the in the <coughs> in the set of vorticities that have the same uh, mass distribution as uh, omega naught over r. Okay. So if you do that. It has been proved mathematically that uh, this uh, maximization problem is well posed. It has uh, at least one maximum, and you can derive the Euler equation, the Euler-Lagrange equation. And uh, and for uh, e sufficiently large, the, the ratio e over p sufficiently large, it really looks like a vortex ring. You can even uh, uh, prove some asymptotics on the on the minimizers of uh, of this problem. But so it is a maximizer under. Uh, and their momentum constraint. And the ideas of uh, maximizing in, the, in classes of transport of a fixed uh, uh, density measure of vorticity dates back to, to Arnold. For the gross pitayevsky the same program holds, just that it's no longer a maximizer, it is a minimizer. Now you minimize the uh, gross pitayevsky uh, energy under a momentum constraint. And uh, so there is an analogy between Euler and gross pitayevsky but uh, it's not a complete analogy in the sense that where one is a maximizer, the other one is a minimizer. Yeah? But remember also that there are additional degrees of freedom uh, in gross pitayevsky with respect to, uh, to Euler. Okay, but still we have a well, well posed problem. We have minimizers to this problem and those minimizers are exact traveling wave solution of the, of the gross pitayevsky equation. Okay, now we want to study many vortices, many vortex rings sharing the same axis of rotation. And uh, the, in order to describe uh, mathematically the result, I have to be a little bit more precise on uh, what will be the energy that uh, will be initially in the systems. And uh, to convince you of that, uh, let's say that the end result which will say that I will start with a situation where I have a number of vortex rings sharing the same axis of rotation. We have seen that these vortex rings arise as minimizers of energy with a fixed momentum. And somehow I am going to ask mathematically that my initial configuration is almost an optimizer of uh, energy for a given vort vort vorticity set, okay? So my initial condition will not be arbitrary. There will be little O of one close in energy to what I believe to be an optimal situation. Say so you, you take what you believe to be an optimal vortex rings and you take many of them at, at a certain distance one from the other, okay? So, but in order to do that and to guess what will be the interaction and, and this is probably close to what uh, Elmholtz did, that part, but which he didn't wrote in his paper. But to, to get, to guess what the, or maybe not to the, uh, to the same level of detail, to get the real ODE, but at least a part of it. So, uh, I t as I said, we will work in the, in the axis symmetric case, so I will, so this will be my Z axis, and I have a little R axis. And I will start with some, uh, some vortices with point A, which will be uh, R of A and Z of A, and there will be many of them, so I will call them AI. Okay, so you have to understand this, as you have a vortex ring like that, and there will be an AJ here, which corresponds to a second, and more of them. So, uh, how does one go? So, I, the, in the limit, when epsilon tends to zero, those vortex rings, which are thin-cored, collapses to lines. 
and uh, mathematically then <coughs> it is convenient to desingularize information which you get on lines to, to, to define things at a fixed uh, finite uh, epsilon. So I consider a, a vector distribution J which is just the uh, <coughs> circulation on uh, so to, to a vortex spring I associate in my mind a, a vector current J which is the vector distribution which is just the circulation along C. So if J corresponds to a curve, uh, a smooth curve, say a closed smooth curve capital C, I consider the vector distribution which to a vector field just computes 2 pi, this, this is because of gross pitaevsky limitation, the integral along the curve C of the vector of my test vector field X along the tangent. So this is a vector distribution, this is a current, think of it as a current in the uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, analogy. So I have my current density capital J and you know that when you have a current density you can associate it to it an induction capital B which satisfies that its divergence is zero and the curl is J. Okay, so this is a singular object, so B will, be, uh, will have a singularity of J on J, but uh, this doesn't matter, I have, I have this capital B. And when I have my induction, I can still go one step further and uh, take my vector potential capital A, which again satisfies this equation, and if you plug the two, you, you get this vector uh, Laplace equation, that the Laplace of A is the is my circle, uh, my curve, uh, capital C. But now my curve will all be uh, uh, <coughs> uh, circles uh, with uh, the z-axis uh, of symmetry. So if I have one, I can write the equation in this uh, axisymmetric uh, setting. You can solve it uh, almost explicitly. This is not uh, uh, the important part, but it, it holds. But the link, the important link with the gross pitaevsky uh, equation is the fact that with this capital uh, A, uh, which is real uh, and uh, singular uh, at delta of A, you can build a test, a singular uh, test function U, uh, which is complex, such that the, the J, of, uh, forget about the R, which are just those uh, due to the fact that the coordinates are not uh, are not the Cartesian coordinates, but that the, the velocity associated to U is the gradient perp of this AI. And you just take uh, the gradient perp of AI and this gives you the speed of, uh, of your little U. So to, to this capital A correspond a, a unitary, and this is an important fact, this little U is unitary uh, little u of a, which is defined this way, and, and the, the, the corresponding of this equation is just written here. So it is, that one is truly divergent free, divergent free, but it is singular, and its curl is really concentrated uh, at the point uh, a. Okay? This cannot be entered in the framework of the gross pitaevsky because it is singular, and it has, a, it has infinite uh, kinetic energy. But so we will uh, regularize it in order to make it enter in the framework of the gross pitaevsky equation. And the way we will regular, regularize it is through an optimal profile in, the, in an energetic way. So our U is singular at that point. We, that, that will become the center of a vortex. Okay? And therefore, we take an optimal profile here around all those vortices that will make them enter in the, in the framework of gross pitaevsky And so we take a 1D stationary solution of the gross pitaevsky uh, equation, okay? And we will just <coughs> multiply our singular UA by this cutoff profile, okay? Which I've been doing here. So this with a star means the singular one and with the epsilon means the regular one, the re regularized one. So I stick with the singular one I multiply by a cutoff function of the distance to the to the center, and this is my this would be if you want the uh, this is close to the minimizer of the gross pitaevsky blah 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 for one uh, vortex. Okay, so this I will call my uh, how would I call it my reference vortex rings. But the fact is that since you have unimodular functions, at least uh, away from the vortices, you can multiply them. To the way to glue them is to just to do a complex multiplication. So now if A is a set of points like here, I just define the singular one as the product of the singular one at point AK and the regularization is the same. And now I have, a, and this is the, now, now this is the kind of initial data that I am going to consider for Gross-Pitaevsky. 
as I, I told you before, I claim that these are initial data for which I can give an uh, information at later time, uh, persistence of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sums of vortex rings. So in mathematical terms, one can measure the, the way by which the vorticity of this is close to a sum of Dirac mass. And this is, uh, uh, you can think of it as being the distance between the, the center of the vortices and those point uh, AI. And we can compute also the energy. We just expand in terms of, uh, of this, this function, capital A, I told, was almost explicit, at least in terms of some uh, special functions. And you compute the Hamiltonian, you give an expression. Uh, maybe what is most interesting in, in this expression is that well, I can, there are many parts. There are some constants here. You can forget about those constants. But there is, this is an interaction part between, because you see it's not present if there is only one vortex. So this will account for the interaction between the vortex rings. And uh, this is a part uh, which is non-interaction and which is the energy of a, of a single vortex ring. So you see it's proportional to the radius times the log of this uh, epsilon. So this is the main order term is uh, r, the radius times the log epsilon. In particular, it is a singular uh, as, as epsilon uh, tends to zero. And so uh, if life is good uh, or if mathematics is good, we would hope at least if, if there is sufficient stability in those solutions, we would hope that in the limit as epsilon tends to zero, uh, because this is also always up to a big O of epsilon or little O of one when epsilon goes to zero. So this is an epsilon to zero limit. But the result will be at fixed small epsilon. We would hope that since the gross pitayevsky uh, equation is the Hamiltonian flow for the Ginzburg-Landau energy, the, at the limit, the motion of the vortex ring should follow the Hamiltonian flow for this expansion of the uh, of the of the um, Ginzburg-Landau energy, which is this Hamiltonian, which just depends on epsilon and on the position of the centers of the vortex rings. And this is the uh, this is the uh, just what I said. So the, the, the Hamiltonian flow associated to H epsilon is here. And uh, this is actually the theorem that we proved. Uh, and so if I don't want to enter too much in the details, the, the important thing is if initially the vorticity, so U epsilon zero is the initial data, if its vorticity is sufficiently close to a sum of Dirac masses, I call that R A zero, this is a concentration scale at time zero, if my excess of energy, I say excess because I believe that this is, I believe it is an outcome of the theorem, that this is up to little o of one, the optimum energy for a given uh, configuration of vortex rings. If this is not too big, I call it the energy excess, and the theorem says if the energy excess and the concentration scale are sufficiently small, depending on uh, just the, the data of the, of the uh, of the systems, but not on the, on, not on the initial data, then the, the concentration at time uh, s okay, is still small. It's exponentially diverging, but on a, on a, a scale of time one, it is control, controlled by what I add at the initial time, where these new points, a i epsilon of s, are the solution of the ODE of the previous, of the previous slides. So of this ODE here. So I take an initial data for the PDE. It has some, by assumption, it has some vortices. I let the vortices evolve by the ODE. I compare the solution of the PDE at time t with what would be just by moving the vortices with the ODE. And I can say that there are clauses in some mathematical norm. Okay. So this is the what we call a mathematical justification of the, of the leapfrogging phenomena. Now, uh, to finish, I will just uh, um, give some more details, because they are worth, I think, of this flow, this ODE flow, this Hamiltonian flow, when there are only two vortex rings, and just to recover the leapfrogging observed by Euler. So in that case, uh, <coughs> well, there are four variables, huh? because if I have two, uh, if I have two vortex rings, both are in the plane here, so I have four independent 
uh, parameters, but I so I cannot uh, write the the phase the phase uh, space easily. But there are some conserved quantities. One is the momentum p, okay, and it turns out that p in that case corresponds to the sum of the r square. So actually, to the to the area, the sum of the areas of the disk is something which is conserved by the ODE flow. So you can take it as a uh, you fix it. Okay, and then you can define a new parameter eta. The sum has to be p. This plus this has to be equal to p. And so I define this variable eta in this way, which is between minus one and plus one. And the other invariance of the system is that if I have two rings here or two rings here, the situation is the same. So translation by the z-axis is also a, a, a possible way of reduction of variable. And therefore, I, I take this second variable xi as the difference between the height of the two uh, vortex rings. And then you can plug the capital H, H epsilon, so the, the Hamiltonian at the ODE level, as a function of eta and xi. Okay? And this is the phase, uh, <coughs> the phase portrait of it. And you distinguish a certain number of, of regions. One region here where you have the, um, the periodic solutions, which corresponds to the leapfrogging, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, so one is in front of the other when uh, z is larger, z of, uh, when eta is positive, and uh, they have interchanged their position where eta is negative, so here or here. Uh, you have different, uh, but you have still, you have also other regions, which were not mentioned by, uh, by Elmos, but you can easily uh, understand these. This would correspond to the situation, so eta is close to one, so that means that you have a very big, uh, vortex rings and a very small one. And the very small one is going to pass inside the big one and not to be catched by it. It will just uh, perturb it a little bit. You see that the, the streamlines are not, are not uh, horizontal, but shaped. And uh, maybe most interesting are these regions here, which correspond to a situation where, so let's say that the, the top part here is when the A1 is on, is, uh, is, uh, on top, is the highest one in Z. So in that case, it is, it is uh, above uh, the second vortex rings, but the second vortex ring is, is catching it because it's almost, uh, no, sorry, it's not the uh, top and bottom, it's a uh, xi, eh, which corresponds to the difference, uh, the, the eta corresponds to the radius, to the difference of radius. So, so initially here, I have uh, xi, which is negative, which means that A1 is below A2. It is approaching because xi is increasing up to a point where they have the same radius, but it cannot uh, penetrate it. That the, the first one maybe was afraid of it, and therefore, as time goes by, the xi is going back to, uh, to zero. So they were like that. It started to approach, it started to approach, but it wasn't uh, fast enough to penetrate it and to, <coughs> to do the leapfrogging motion, and in the end, they do that again. And you still have those uh, crossing points here, those uh, which correspond to so either those heteroclinics or those fixed points. This is actually a stationary solution at the level of the ODU, which correspond to two vortex rings that travel with the same, uh, the same speed. But they have to have a particular uh, difference here, depending on, on their radius. And uh, so I'm supposed to stop now, I guess. Yeah. You, uh, if I still have two minutes, then, uh, so uh, this was, this is something I didn't uh, mention maybe sufficiently clearly, but I had all my vortex rings with the same uh, direction. They were all going uh, north, say up, okay? Uh, translated here in the fact that I have only positive deltas. I could have a, a di here, which would be plus one or minus one for vortex ring, I, take, I took all of them with the same, um, the same orientation, so all the vortices were going up. Now you can ask yourself what happens if you take two vortices, one going up, one going down, and the, the, the frontal co collision, and, and there life is probably much more complicated. So this is also an experiment by uh, Lin in, Sing Lim in Singapore. And this is something I would like, uh, since there are many talks, and one of the goal of Becassim was to, uh, to have a good uh, computational means for gross pitaevsky uh, This is a classical fluid, but I'm sure the same can be done for, um, for quantum fluids. And uh, I would be very much interested in seeing numerical simulation of the following beautiful experiments of links, so you just throw them 
once again each other, and then it's going to make some complicated. Okay, so so one maybe one remark is that you should not do, you should not consider that life is simple and place yourself in cylindrical coordinates because even though the initial data is cylindrically symmetric, this is not conserved by life. You see, life is never perfectly symmetric, cylindrically symmetric, and uh, and as you see, the the, the symmetry is is, is broken. Huh? This is not this is not uh, symmetric by rotation under the theta axis. But you also see that those vortex strings, uh, even though uh, there is turbulence and, and so on, uh, they seem to be uh, well attached to life. And uh, even when you break them, they want to reform some uh, vortex strings. Here you see a big vortex strings with uh, these are called, uh, those oscillations are called Kelvin waves. This was already a known, uh, it's not an instability because these are complex uh, um, eigenvalues of a vortex ring. So I think this would be a very nice, uh, I don't know how you call that uh, uh, in numerical simulation, a benchmark or a, a test. Uh, reproduce this within this week. <laughs> okay, I thank you for your attention. So, questions? So there's a huge literature on the classical fluid vortex rings and all the studies. And of particular interest are analytical solutions of vortex rings. Yes. And for all our equation, there is only one closed uh, analytical solution is the spherical hill yeah. vortex ring, which is not of interest for practical application. Yes. And there are several families and models of vortex rings yes. which are of interest. For the GP equation, would it be a chance to have uh, an analytical form of the uh, vortex ring? No, it's probably not analytical, and it's related to the fact that they are, they are much more, uh, let me come back to, to this, uh, there, there are much more degrees of freedom at that level for oil, oil, and it's related to the fact that you can fix, a, you can fix this omega knot. <coughs> okay, so... Uh, <laughs> So in some sense, you have a much, this is something very well known for Euler, there, there is a very rich family of either stationary solution or stationary in, yeah, a, in, a, in a reference yeah. vortex rings. Sorry? Yeah. It would and, be a function of, uh, a string function might be a yes. Uh, yes, but you can fix this omega knot as you wish, okay? And in that family, you, you, have a, you have an optimizer. So if you take it to be a constant, then you recover the... the um, well, else is in the, in the limit where mp is zero, but, uh, but for arbitrary p, you also, you also have vortex rings with, uh, with, a, fixed, uh, with a constant vorticity. Then yes, a, a question regarding the last movie that was so beautiful. Yes. Um, so do you know if this kind of uh, catastrophic behavior occurs for any velocity? Uh, no, oh. <laughs> so actually, the, the, uh, the, the students which, uh, from which I showed the video, they were in contact for a while with, uh, with Lim in Singapore. So I have never met him. Uh, but uh, I mean, I believe that cannot be exceptional. Or if it was so exceptional, you would not be able to catch it. Uh, in water, I mean, it's not. It's not a, when you simulate something, you can say that maybe that was part of the code and of the discretization that make this. But this, this is real life. So if if you can observe it in real life, it has. Some. But probably what is important is that the, the, the two vortex rings that you produce are uh, very uh, good ones in the sense that very neat ones and that they are perfectly aligned, I would say. If not, the, so it's I, going I to be wondering. totally different. Uh, it, it is also studied, the, the non, uh, uh, so when they make an angle, it was uh, also part of the... I, I, I remember so seeing some experiments that were a bit similar to that where uh, they have vortex ring getting close to a free surface, so just water. Yes, it, it is, uh, this is more a 2D kind, uh, uh, yes, but uh, in mathematics there is something called the method of images and it's yes, about exactly, the same, exactly. so yes. But it was not so dramatic. Yes. <laughs>
the, 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 the because six, you the cannot you cannot do what because you have the wall, so it cannot do what it does here. And so there are other effects with the wall. Uh, yeah. Actually, already Helmholtz, if you read Helmholtz's paper, he, he already mentioned this fact that if a vortex swing hits a wall, it will increase its radius. It was all there in Helmholtz's paper. Yeah, so just to follow up on uh, Jonathan's question, there is the uh, class of uh, vortex uh, ring solutions for Euler, which uh, feature uh, um, swirl which is the actual velocity component. Yes. So I was wondering if anything like this has ever been observed for uh, gross No, but even uh, I, I remember I uh, looked on the literature, but I was not much convinced about those uh, swirling uh, vortex swings even for Euler. Well, there are just uh, analytical solutions. There is uh, one, uh, yes. there's a generalization of Hill's vortex. Uh, to account for swirl, which was uh, constructed yes, analytically. Yes, yes, and you can go all the way up to Beltrami flows by, by making the, yeah. the, yes. There's a paper by Moffat from, uh, and uh, yes, but Fukumoto, I think. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But they are probably much less stable than the, than the non-swirling uh, non ones. And, oh, uh, stability is a I different mean, question. It's, it, the, the mathematical theory is not already developed. I mean, the, the, uh, what we've been doing here, for example, analyzing two vortex rings for Euler, it's not, it's open problem. It, it has not been closed. So before considering swearing froze, froze, we would like to, uh, unless there are the things are simpler with swearing froze, which it could be with very large world, but I, I doubt it. Well, things are not simpler. They are much more complicated because uh, for the problem with the swear, there is no uh, sort of a uh, green spectrum, unlike the problem without swear. Yes. Have, uh, the green spectrum, there is none available for the yeah. Yeah. But uh, in in a sense, uh, here I just use the, the green function to to compute the Hamiltonian. But in the end, it's not it's not important uh, in the in the mathematical analysis. It was just to have a, a, a nice Hamiltonian which I can show to you. But in a sense, we don't use uh, that well, the exact form of uh, of the um, of the green function. Just uh, only its asymptotics, which are all the same. Okay, uh, I have one comment. I, I, I already uh, simulated the uh, uh, oh, nice. dynamics in GP equation, and in my simulations, uh, peri uh, period is not constant. When peri uh, period becomes large and large, periodic boundary by, conditions. by emitting sound waves. Oh yes, this is uh, one of the one of the difficult question uh, at the mathematical level. But you see that in in our analysis there is a epsilon which has to be small and then some error. So this is a, a trick that mathematicians use to uh, to put some uh, problem under the under the carpet and. <laughs> But other than that, uh, other than that, you can just say, well, we have many terms which we don't know. So, so in a sense, the, the answer is in this in this asymptotic, these terms are smaller. So, for example, the sound waves, or there, you, you, it is also something which is very much discussed at the level of the of the Euler equation. These uh, uh, stretching and increase of length of vortices. This is something which we prove not to happen in the limit epsilon tends to zero and in the time scales which we are studying. So we do not claim that these are effects that are inexistent, but these are terms which in the limit epsilon tends to zero are uh, smaller with respect to the one we are studying. Okay, so there are probably, there are many things that are not captured by, uh, by this limit flow, but we prove that these are lower order in the asymptotics which we study. Thank but you. sound waves surely exist. Thank you. And they dissipate probably part of the energy of it. Okay, a lot of questions. Any more? Good. Okay, let's thank uh, the speaker for the wonderful presentation. <laughs>